So with us today, we have Michael Kugelman, uh, who's the Deputy Director for the Asia Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. So he's also the Center's Senior Associate of South Asia. And his specialty areas include Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and American relations with each of these countries. And uh, next, we also have Rumi Zavas, and she is an associate professor at the College of International Security Affairs at the National Defense University, where she teaches courses on South Asian politics, statecraft, and the Muslim world. Uh, she's been the lecturer and program coordinator at the uh, MA in Global Security Studies at John Hopkins University and editor and publications manager at the Migration Policy Institute. Uh, next we have Matt Dupe, uh, and he is a senior South Asia expert and analyst for the U.S. Defense Department. He previously served as a research associate at the Naval Postgraduate School's Remote Sensing Center and for the Program for Cultural, Culture and Conflict Studies. Uh, his studies focus on licit and illicit aspects of the extra, extra activity in, <laughs> industry, I'm sorry, organized crime, state building, and insurgency. And last but not least, we have Matt Deering, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Regional and Analytic Studies at the College of International Security Affairs uh, at the National Defense University. He directs the South and Central Asia Security Studies Program. Uh, and his re research focus focuses on the function and behavior of paramilitary groups in developing states with fieldwork and archival research in Afghanistan and Malawi. So today we're here to talk a little bit about the White House's new or relatively new strategy in South Asia. And so this strategy uh, was kind of premised on three basic precepts of um, securing a victory in Afghanistan. Um, along with dealing um, with, I'm sorry, uh, an exit strategy for Afghanistan, hopefully in the somewhat near future. And uh, thirdly, it is to look at the threats emanating from the region and how Pakistan can also assist in stabilizing South Asia, um, but has relied a little more heavily on India. So nine months after this unveiling of this strategy, how much closer is the United States and its allies towards stabilizing the complex security uh, environment in Afghanistan? And so our panelists today are going to cover persistent challenges facing Afghanistan and its neighbors and the American endeavors upon a broader South Asia security uh, challenge. So with that, I would like to start off with Michael uh, to talk a little bit about the challenges in, in Pakistan. Right. Thanks a lot, Ginger. Uh, I assume everyone can hear me. Um, thank you for, uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to be in this panel. It's a great group, so I know we'll have a a very um, uh, engrossing discussion. Uh, so I've been asked to speak briefly about the um, about security issues in Pakistan and challenges for the United States in that context. So in that regard, my comments will revolve around a bit of a paradox. Um, and the paradox, as I see it, is this. The security situation in Pakistan has eased considerably uh, over the last few years. But this better security situation actually crystallizes the challenges that the U.S. faces uh, in and with Pakistan. So, you know, the question is, why would a better security situation in Pakistan point to challenges for the U.S.? Because, you know, the main U.S. interest in Pakistan is stability. Um, so one would expect a more stable Pakistan would ease U.S. challenges. And I'll explain why. <clears throat> but first, just a, a bit of broader context about the security situation in Pakistan today. There are um, fewer terrorist attacks. There are fewer uh, civilian deaths from terrorist violence in recent years. And um, you know, if you look at um, databases like the South Asia Terrorism Portal, SATP, uh, it'll show that there were about 3,000 civilian deaths from terrorism in 2012, 
uh, and 2013 as well. But the figure has fallen steadily in the years since then. Last year, 2017, the figure was 540. So that's a significant fall. Um, this is attributable in great part to a Pakistani counterterrorism offensive in the North Waziristan uh, Tribal Agency, which was launched in 2014. It's called Zarbi Azub uh, in Pakistan. It was launched in June 2014 after an attack, a horrific attack on the airport in Karachi, Pakistan's main city. A number of people wrongly think that the operation was launched after an even more horrific attack on a, uh, an army-run school uh, in Peshawar that killed more than 100 children. But that happened in December um, 2014. The Zarbi Abzib offensive was, was launched in, in June of 2014. So that offensive, it badly degraded the capacities of the major sources of anti-state militancy in Pakistan, mainly the Pakistani Taliban terror group and its, and its affiliates. Um, remnant factions of the Pakistani Taliban remain. Uh, they are in, in great part based in Afghanistan. Um, today, there are certainly still terrorist attacks in Pakistan, but um, relatively isolated and um, certainly, they don't happen in urban spaces to the extent that they were happening several years ago. So, what, what are the implications of this better security situation for the U.S.? Uh, and this is where I start to get to that paradox I mentioned before. So, on one level, um, absolutely, you know, it is a boost for U.S. policy, given that um, it's the chief U.S. interest in Pakistan is indeed uh, stability. But um, more broadly, it exacerbates the challenges for U.S.-Pakistan relations. And the question is why. Um, quite plainly, the better security situation in, ba in Pakistan now underscores the disconnects in U.S.-Pakistan relations that make the relationship so dysfunctional and so difficult. Um, so, you know, Pakistan claims essentially that it has solved its terrorism problem. Uh, it points to the better security environment in the country and says, uh, look, we've cleaned up the problem, uh, we've cleaned up the anti-state militants, and our work is generally done. Um, so, you know, I was, had the opportunity to go to North Waziristan last November. Um, I was brought, the uh, Pakistani military brought me and several other American analysts over there to take a look at what had been done, uh, to get an indication of how the situation had improved. So, you know, we were brought to Miran Shah in the capital of North Waziristan, which had been a war zone, a no-go area for, for many years. Um, you know, we, we were driven around on new roads, there were new markets that were uh, built, there, were, um, there was a new hospital. Um, and so, you know, the narrative that we heard, which is heard all the time in Pakistan, is things have improved in a big way. We don't, need to, we don't have to worry about this terrorism problem anymore. Um, Pakistan claims that the remaining perpetrators of terrorism in Pakistan are actually based across the border in Afghanistan. Um, uh, the, terror, the Pakistanis will say that the terror groups that stage attacks in Pakistan are essentially all based in Afghanistan. So this includes the likes of Jamaat ul arar which is a faction of the Pakistani Taliban, a faction of Lashkar-e Jangvi, which is a uh, sectarian extremist group from Pakistan, um, Lashkar-e Jangvi al alami and also ISIS, uh, which of course has developed a presence in the region, has a considerable presence in Afghanistan, <clears throat> and does stage attacks in, in Pakistan. Um, and you know, I, I would argue that Pakistan is largely right in this regard, that most of the attacks happening in, in Pakistan now are staged by groups that are based in Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, in Pakistan's view, the U.S. needs to work with Afghanistan um, to go after these Afghanistan-based groups. And, you know, Pakistan says that it will do its part by building a fence along its border um, to keep militants from coming into Pakistan. And I've seen the fence when I was in North Waziristan a few months ago. Uh, I was brought over there and saw it from the Pakistani side. It's, it's about 12 feet high. It's not that dramatic, but uh, we were told there's a lot of technology and gadgetry that makes it hard for anyone to get close to it. So the bottom line is that Pakistan concludes that when it comes to counterterrorism, its, its job is done. So this is one big disconnect in U.S.-Pakistan relations. Now for the U.S., in the U.S.'s view, Pakistan's work on counterterrorism is not done. Um, you know, and the U.S. certainly appreciates the fact that terror has subsided in Pakistan, but Washington continues to worry in a really big way about the terror groups that continue to be based in Pakistan yet do not stage attacks and have not been dealt with by the Pakistanis. So obviously, talking about the Haqqani network and the broader Afghan Taliban, Lashkar-e Taiba, Jaish-e Mohammed, you know, the Haqqanis and the, the Taliban are leading the insurgency in Afghanistan, killing American troops there, 
uh, while Lashkar-e Taiba, Jaishi Mohammed, they, they target India, America's close friend. Um, Pakistan, however, regards these groups as assets. It's happy to let them use Pakistani soil for um, whatever term you want to use, maybe not sanctuary, safe haven, safe space, whatever you, however you want to put it. So another series of disconnects to lay out here. Um, when it comes to many of the terror groups in Pakistan, America's enemies are Pakistan's assets, quite frankly. Um, Pakistan has done the most and lost the most lives and made the biggest sacrifices going after the terror groups that are relatively low on America's list of priorities. Now, I emphasize the term relatively. Obviously, this is not to say that the U.S. doesn't care about the Pakistani Taliban, Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS. Of course it does. Um, these being groups that the Pakistanis, oftentimes in cooperation with the Americans, have, have targeted. But at this moment in time, U.S. strategic interests um, dictate that um, the Haqqanis are much more of a priority. Um, and Pakistan, of course, is seen by the U.S. as not really doing anything to, to go after them. So another disconnect is that Pakistan has done the least uh, to go after the groups that worry America the most. So this all exacerbates what it really is a fair amount of mistrust and ill will in U.S.-Pakistan relations. Pakistan accuses America of ignoring uh, not only its counterterrorism success stories, but also the sacrifices and the lost lives that have um, that have accumulated, so to speak, in authoring these success stories. Uh, I mean, you know, the Pakistanis accused the Americans of fixating only on uh, on the Haqqanis and groups like that. So, you know, I think that from Pakistan's perspective, you could argue this is not an irrational position to take. Um, you know, any nation state will logically prioritize the threats that pose the most direct threats to the state. And that's what Pakistan's done. It's gone after the groups that stage attacks in the country. But there certainly is another view that's definitely embraced by the U.S. government, and this is a view that argues that Pakistan makes a very big and a very dangerous mistake by not going after these groups that hang out in Pakistan um, without staging attacks in the country. And I, and I would agree with this viewpoint, um, and that is this, that Pakistan is essentially playing with fire um, by maintaining links to these militant assets, and for two reasons. One, any terror group, regardless of who it's targeting, um, and where it stage attacks, where it stages attacks, is, is inherently destabilizing. And two, you know, all of these, most or most of these Islamist militant groups in Pakistan and the region, they're cut from the same ideological cloth. So it's actually quite common for members of one, uh, for, for members of one of Pakistan's militant assets to jump ship to an anti-state group. And you know, just a few examples. Um, one of the more recent ones, a guy named Mas Gol, who is. Um, he was a Kashmir uh, freedom fighter in the 1990s. He had close ties to Pakistani intelligence. Uh, there was a U.S. diplomatic cable that uh, WikiLeaks released a few years ago that described this guy as a former army major, uh, a, Pakistan, former, a former Pakistani army major. Um, he went quiet for a few years, and then in 2004, he resurfaced as a leader with the Pakistani Taliban. And then a much more well-known name, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, Ilyas Kashmiri, uh, like Mas Gol, he was a, a Kashmir uh, or an anti-India fighter um, with close ties to Pakistan, and he ended up becoming an Al Qaeda commander. And he was droned a few years back. And then there's another one, uh, Asimatullah Muwaya, who is a leader of Jaish e Mohammed, which is an anti-India group with ties to Pakistani intelligence. He has since resurfaced as a Pakistani Taliban leader. So I think these are important things um, to uh, to keep. Uh, this this panel is talking about um, what's the adjective? <coughs> Continuous challenges, persistent. persistent challenges. Yes, persistent challenges. So here is a persistent challenge, um, and I'll pose it as a question: What if anything can the U.S. do to get Pakistan to change its policy so that it goes after the terror groups that worry Washington the most? So you know, the U.S. government has the Trump administration already has an answer. I mean, it said it's going to tighten the screws, it's going to apply more pressure on the Pakistanis to get them to buckle down and, and change course. And you know, proponents of this policy in the White House and outside of it will say, well, you know, the U.S. has never tried this before. It's never been willing to go beyond aid cuts and relatively modest tactics like that. So why not try to go further and you know, do one of many things? And there have been a number of possibilities that have been floated around that have been leaked to the media. Things like expanding, the drone, extra, expanding drone strikes well beyond the tribal areas, uh, perhaps staging a few unilateral raids in Pakistan to go after terrorists that Pakistan won't go after, 
And even, you know, the, the, perhaps the nuclear issue, designating Pakistan, the nuclear option, designating Pakistan as a state sponsor of terror. So the question is if this will work, or if this would work. You know, Pakistan, I would argue, has very strong interests that entail maintaining ties to these militants that the, uh, the Americans want them to uh, sever ties with. And Pakistan views them as an asymmetric asset, um, you know, an unconventional way of pushing back against India, which is a country that is far too powerful and large for Pakistan to fight conventionally. You know, Pakistan has fought India in three and a half wars, and it's lost all of them. Um, so it would take a lot, in my view, for Pakistan to change its calculus and, and cast aside its, its long-standing policy. There's also the possible of retaliation. Pakistan could retaliate if, um, if the U.S. applies more pressure. You know, Pakistan could shut down the, supply, the NATO supply line, uh, the NATO supply routes on its soil. Um, it did this before, in 2011. I would argue it's even riskier now than it was back then. Um, you know, on the one hand, the, you know, the U U.S. forces would have to use the more costly and circuitous routes in Central Asia, but the new, di the new variable now is, that, um, is, is Russia. Um, you know, the U.S.-Russia relationship is in a much worse place than it had been, and uh, you know, there's reason to uh, worry that Russia would try to hamper U.S. access to these alternative supply routes. And Pakistan could also cut off all security and intelligence cooperation with the U.S., which could make it difficult for the U.S. to pursue its counterterrorism goals. It could be more difficult for it to get access to intelligence to help it deal with uh, uh, carry out drone strikes. And quite frankly, it would also make it more difficult for the U.S. to be monitoring Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. Um, and finally, you know, another risk is the, is the risk of exhausting the policy toolkit, so to speak. Um, you know, let's say the U.S. decides to take caution measures. Let's take it. Let's say it decides to declare Pakistan as a state sponsor of terror. Um, now, once you've done that, you can't do it again, right? Um, and if Pakistan does not change its behavior in ways that the U.S. would want it to, then you know you're stuck. You're out of luck. Um, and you're also out of leverage. So I think the essential question for U.S. policymakers, and I'll, I'll wrap up here, the essential question is what would the circumstances need to be for Pakistan to conclude that it can no longer afford to maintain these ties to terrorists? And what would it take to get Pakistan to the point where it concludes that the costs of this policy are too high? So I'd argue that it will be very difficult to produce these circumstances and bring about these costs. Um, you know, would the U.S., for example, really consider taking its war uh, in Afghanistan into Pakistan? Would it really decide to stage airstrikes on militant targets, not just in the tribal areas, but Baluchistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, even Punjab, where you have some Haqqani network leaders have, have hung out near Islamabad and Rawalpindi? Pindi? Um, you know, would the U.S. really target Pakistani military facilities to get the military to comply with U.S. demands? Now, these measures may compel the Pakistanis to comply, but they certainly may not. Michael? Um, yes. I could project. How's this one? Yes. This is better. Um, my point here is, you know, would the U.S. really be able to get Pakistan to do what it wants it to do if you took these super draconian uh, measures? Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the U.S. doesn't really have any interest, in my view, doing the things that I just mentioned. Um, then there's the other extreme. What if the U.S. were to go out of its way to try to accommodate Pakistani interests um, in order to get it to change its tack on militancy? So let's say that the Americans decided to come out and make a really strong pitch on Pakistan's behalf for a renegotiation of the Kashmir uh, dispute. Let's say the Americans warn India not to meddle in Baluchistan or tell India to scale back its presence in, in, in Afghanistan. Now, given how important the U.S., given the importance that the U.S. values and accords to its uh, relationship with India, and given the lack of appetite in the Trump administration to engage the Pakistanis in this way, I think there's no way that the U.S. would do either of these things. So basically, to conclude, this really leaves the U.S. with two options, neither of which is ideal. One, it can just stick with, with the status quo, which is untenable except that the Pakistanis will continue to provide space to these militant groups, or it can try to ramp up the pressure, take that risk, and risk the possibility of untenable retaliations that are damaging to U.S. interests. And there are other policy options that the U.S. could try, and I'm happy to discuss these more in the discussion. You know, one is it could try to do everything possible to ensure that it can overcome retaliatory measures that Pakistan may take in response to U.S. pressure. So this includes, you know, somehow guaranteeing those safe and effective alternative supply routes, which would be very difficult to do in Central Asia, given the Russia factor. Um, 
but also theoretically it would have to entail trying to work with, of all countries, Iran uh, to use its soil to transport military supplies. Now, at this very moment, Iran is or has been trying to work with, uh, with India and Afghanistan to build this new uh, transport corridor project from the Chabahar port in southern Iran into Afghanistan. Um, now, you know, the interesting thing, it's easy to forget, Iran has actually helped the U.S. a lot in Afghanistan uh, in the past. You know, in the early days of the war in 2001, it was actually offering intelligence and other information to the U.S. about al-Qaeda locations in Afghanistan. But the problem is, I think we clearly know, and especially given the events of the last 24 hours, the U.S. is not interested in working with Iran. It's a non-starter. And Iran doesn't want to work with the U.S. And I think there's evidence that Tehran is trying to hinder more than help the, uh, the U.S. war effort in Afghanistan by intensifying small arms shipments to the Taliban. I imagine that'll ramp up now that the, you know, the U.S. has pulled out of the nuclear deal. And, you know, one more option is for the two sides, the U.S. and the Pakistan, the Pakistanis, simply to try to talk more. Um, have them get together, articulate their chief interests and needs, and see if they can work out some sort of common ground that addresses the interests and needs of both sides, including Washington's interest in, in getting Pakistan to deal with those cross-border militants. And you know, I've been overseeing a track two dialogue on U.S.-Pakistan relations over the last year or so. We've tried to do this, um, but um, we haven't really experienced any breakthroughs. So I think the problem is that the Trump administration is impatient. It's really not interested in these broader dialogues, and especially with Pakistan. Its focus on Pakistan is very narrowly defined and focused on the groups that are killing Americans in Afghanistan. In Pakistan, in Afghanistan. So this is all about you know, America first, protecting American lives. So I think the bottom line is that the U.S. and Pakistan will continue to cooperate, albeit in very narrowly defined ways that revolve around working together to combat shared threats, al-Qaeda, ISIS, and so on. I just don't think they'll find common ground on dealing with these, the, the issue with these other militant groups. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so we're going to hold uh, questions till the end. Uh, and so next we're going to turn to Ramis, who's going to talk about some of the opportunities and challenges uh, that India has in Afghanistan. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so India celebrated its 70th birthday last year in 2017. And because of that milestone, we've seen a lot of political commentary um, that takes stock of India's development, its role in the region, its role in the world, um, how is it continuing to advance to great power status. And as India becomes stronger, economically stronger, militarily stronger, this strength seems to come with uh, our collective expectations of more power projection. Um, also in, in the military domain, um, in relation to Afghanistan in particular, about a year ago, there was this flurry of reporting that India was about to spend, send 15,000 troops to Afghanistan, and it was reported all over like the Pakistani military forums, and it was a big part of it. It could have been a rumor that came from a Wilson Center yes. event, right? Yes. Is that right? That's what I remember. We could discuss um, that later. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't turn out to be true, and in right. fact, later that year, the Indian defense minister said, we're not sending troops to Afghanistan, um, but there has been that possibility in the air, um, not about troops on the ground as much, but about deepened military and security cooperation. Um, on the U.S. side, the Trump administration has made it pretty clear that they would like to see a greater Indian role in Afghanistan, right? So just to remind you of the August speech, um, President Trump said, a critical part of the South Asia strategy for America is to develop its strategic partnership with India, the world's largest democracy and a key security and economic partner of the United States. We appreciate India's important contributions to stability in Afghanistan, but India makes billions of dollars in trade with the United States, and we want them to help us more with Afghanistan. Um, so it, it was also a classic political line for a domestic audience like, hey, you're trading with us, now help us out. But more broadly, it has, it, this is actually not such a change in U.S. administration policy. U.S. administrations from President George W. Bush, President Obama, and now President Trump have all wanted deeper security cooperation with India. All of our administrations have asked India to commit troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, and India has so far declined and recently declined again. So on the U.S. side, we're, we're open to it. Um, we want more Indian presence in Afghanistan. Um, and then the Modi administration 
maybe is a break from past Indian administrations and more willingness to step a little closer to that, uh, to that cooperation, security cooperation with the United States. There's still a limit, um, not as far as the United States would like to see, but certainly more willingness. So all of these developments on the Indian side, on the American side, um, just the fact of India's rise point to a possible more robust security footprint in Afghanistan. So today I want to make the case that this is a bad idea for India. Um, and also a case that this is not such a great idea for long-term... Uh, Can you talk a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, how's that? Um, and also not such a great idea for long-term U.S. Um, interests or Afghanistan interests either. So that is what I would, that's where my remarks are going. Um, basically, I'm, I want to argue to you that India shouldn't deploy its military to Afghanistan. That's, it's not exactly planning on doing currently, but it also should be, it should limit its weapons deals and it should even be pretty careful um, or selective rather about the non-lethal military or security aid that it's providing um, for the sake actually of its own security and economic interests. Um, so what I'd like to do is sort of outline what is India currently doing in Afghanistan and what are some prospects of what it might do, how it might reasonably expand in the future. Um, what are Indians, what are uh, the Indian interests in the region and are the possibilities for more security cooperation, are they mapping on to those interests? And clearly, my answer is not exactly, not, not entirely. It's complicated, right? I'm not, but not exactly. And and then what what should be done? So that's where we're going. Um, in terms of what India is currently doing, the basic picture is that um, in total, India has contributed about three billion dollars in aid to uh, to Afghanistan. Um, the international figure over the last decade is uh, more than one hundred billion. So it's a relatively small part of the aid from the Americans and the Europeans for sure, but nevertheless, it is a substantial bit of aid. It's the biggest regional donor, including China. Um, it also, I guess we should also keep in mind that the, uh, the lion's share of Indian development aid doesn't go to Afghanistan, it goes to Bhutan. Um, sign a significant disparity in that. So even in terms of India's own regional priorities and where Indian energy is going, Bhutan is, is very, very important in terms of where the dollars are going. Nevertheless, aid to Afghanistan is rising. Um, what does that aid look like? Well, there's high profile projects that you all have heard of, like the financing of the parliament building in Kabul. There's the Salma Dam, which is called the Friendship Dam also between India and Afghanistan and Herat. Um, I'd just like to say a little bit about the Salma Dam. So, India is financing, uh, it was inaugurated, right? India Finance helped construct it. In order to do that, Indian shipping had to go to the port of Bandar Abbas in Iran, but that port doesn't accommodate really high tonnage cargo. So what they had to do was actually go to the UAE, switch on to smaller ships, and then and pay those taxes over there, and then go to Iran to get the materials to Bandar Abbas, travel through highway in Iran, cross the border to Afghanistan, and make their way to Herat. Um, so that's how India achieved its presence with the Salma Dam. Um, it's a successful hydroelectric project, successful project for watering the uh, a large swath of the surrounding area. So what India would like to, that's why India is developing, wants to develop, is developing is maybe a strong statement at this point, but wants to develop the Chabahar port, um, which is further along the Iranian coast, um, if you can picture that coastline to the east. Um, it means that ships can offload, Indian ships can offload their material directly. Then India is financing a railroad link to an Iranian city on the Afghan border. It's just a much easier way to access Afghanistan and then the rest of Central Asia. Um, so the Chabahar port development is pretty important, even though it's in Iran, it's a pretty important part of what India is doing in Afghanistan, and I think it makes sense to sort of put that in the Afghanistan category in our minds a little bit. Um, there's some problems with that project. It's India has been committed to it since 2003, and they constructed two terminals, and then progress slowed down as the West 
uh, led sanctions against Iran, and then it picked up again in 2015. But then they had years worth of delays, like there was a disagreement between the Indian and Iranian governments about whether or not India was going to pay excise duties on material that they were sending to Iran. And then there's Indian bureaucratic slowness, which is a bit infamous. And so for any number of reasons, Indian progress on Chabahar development is not what India itself would like to, to see. And uh, in March, uh, Iranian Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif met with, um, in, in Islamabad, he said, he was in Islamabad, and he said that he would welcome Chinese um, help with developing this port as well. Um, because from Iran's perspective, they need this port to be developed, and they have a long-standing relationship with India and want to see the Indians do it, but um, but are dismayed that the Indians have, have not been able to go as fast as that. Anyway, so Chabahar is one thing. Other things India is doing in Afghanistan, scholarships to Afghan students. There are currently upwards of 5,000 Afghan higher education college students studying in Indian universities vocational training really at the local grassroots level to develop uh, women's self-employment skills in, in Afghanistan. Um, you know that Hindi films, TV shows um, are quite popular in Afghanistan. Um, Indian soft power in Afghanistan is big because of a combination of the Bollywood effect and all of the really sort of like close to the heart development projects that India takes in terms of hospitals and women's empowerment and, and stuff like that. Um, in terms of the military, what is India doing in Afghanistan? So for the most part, it is non-lethal assistance. Um, vehicles, bulletproof jackets, stuff like that, but really probably most significantly training thousands of uh, Afghan National Army personnel. Um, and they don't, they don't provide the training in Afghanistan. They go to India for the training and return back um, historically, India has been very reluctant to put a military ground presence in Afghanistan. Um, even that, so, if you remember, the Indian embassy was attacked twice, actually, I think in 2008 or 9, I'm not sure, but attacked twice, and, and other Indian development workers, doctors have been attacked. So, India has put some paramilitary protection forces on the ground for the, and actually, some Indians were just kidnapped, if you've seen in the news a couple, but. Um, but in general, those forces are there to protect diplomats or aid workers, and they're not there for combat, and they're also not there for drain training. And India is careful about that distinction. So in terms of what India might do in the future, well, one thing is that there's a possibility, there are proposals that the forces that are on the ground protecting Indian workers might be redeployed for some sort of a training-related mission or something like that. So that's a possibility. Huge possibility in the realm of um, ISR, intelligence, uh, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, the Indian Navy is very good at this. They have high capabilities. Um, and, and are in a position to train Afghans um, for things like training Afghan operators of, uh, of surveil on surveillance systems or expanding their uh, uh, ability to run reconnaissance missions or conducting military patrols. So training on the in the ISR domain is a possibility. Um, also uh, providing airspace surveillance. The Indians are very good, very good at that. They're one of the leading actors in the space and satellite technology area. So that's another potential avenue for an expanded Indian military-ish uh, presence in Afghanistan. Um, and there's this India-Afghanistan strategic agreement that was signed in 2011 that sort of provides the framework for this kind of expansion. So the political groundwork is there. Um, President Ghani has definitely been requesting more Indian um, defense cooperation, more direct defense cooperation with Afghanistan. He'd like to see it. The Americans would like to see it. The agreements are there to facilitate it. So does this trajectory align with Indian interests? Um, so here are four key Indian interests in the region. Um, the first is to increase markets for trade and especially for access to energy resources of Central Asia. 
that's a key Indian priority. It's very important. India needs energy and it needs more avenues for energy. In order to get that energy, it needs to prevent a political encirclement that would um, uh, enable regional actors, whether that's Pakistan or China, from blocking those trade routes or blocking those deals. Um, so there is a political component to seeking trade and energy resources in Central Asia. Um, I think it's also clearly in the Indian interest to prevent instability, uh, instability at the borders, at the hands of non-state actors or state actors. Um, so the neighborhood first policy is about this goal. Um, things like earthquake aid to Nepal, maybe even missteps in terms of the Nepali peace process um, was an effort to control India's neighborhood. Um, India resolved uh, a long-standing disagreement with Bangladesh about uh, around 50,000 stateless people on the border that had sort of eluded prior administrations. So basically dealing with its neighborhood instability and scope for non-state actors to act against India at its borders. That's an interest. Um, and then, you know, related to all of these, I guess, reducing the threat level from Pakistan and, and China. So, so in terms of what can India do to shore up these interests? So yes, India is a large military power. It's the world's third largest military in terms of personnel strength. Um, it's got the fifth largest defense budget. It's got the seventh largest economy. But India also has significant development challenges, and it really faces significant trade-offs when it engages in power projection. Um, upwards of maybe 270 million people in dire pro poverty infrastructure updates are sorely needed around the country. Um, India's development aid budget uh, abroad is not very high, in part because of these domestic constraints. Um, so, yes, India is the most powerful state in the region, but it's not the most, but, but it, it is economically constrained and it really needs economic openness in the region. It really needs to pursue that to further its own development. It's also not the most powerful actor in the region because it will always have to contend with a combination of US and Russian interests in Afghanistan. And this is really where India shines historically. The act of hedging against rival powers in order to benefit India's own interests. That's something that the Indian foreign policy establishment has some uh, experience and success with. And you can see it now, the way India does it with Iran and Saudi Arabia too, right? It maintains good relations with both Iran, deep economic relations with Iran, but also with um, expanding with the, with the Gulf states. Russian, the Russian footprint in Afghanistan is likely expanding. Russia is cultivating local actors. It is seeing that it doesn't want a full American withdrawal, but its interests don't really align exactly with America either. So, and the way it's cultivating its contacts aren't aligned with America, it's cultivating some Taliban relationships, it's cultivating relationships with the actors in the North, as well as supporting the central government through investments. Russia had its first military exercise with Pakistan in 2016. It's deepening those bilateral ties. So, India, with this superpower involvement in the region, needs to find a way to, uh, to cultivate and deepen ties with both sides in order to pursue that very important economic interest related to trading and, uh, and energy resources in Central Asia. So that's, that's one reason why a security footprint, a deeper security footprint in Afghanistan puts India on one side. Right? If India does what the Americans want, what the Afghan central government wants in terms of security, it reduces the Indian uh, maneuverability on the economic front with a very diverse array of regional actors. The other thing is, India has incredibly good will in Afghanistan right now, and that's probably because it, its military has not spilled Afghan blood for decades of conflict in Afghanistan. And to the extent that India might in the future be 
associated with war rather than development in Afghanistan, it could very well squander that very goodwill. Again, frustrating a broader economic role, goal that could benefit India for decades and decades to, to come. And then the last thing is, very sadly, and like the United States, India is not paying enough attention to its uh, Ministry of External Affairs, to its dip diplomatic budget, right? So at a time when it's trying to project power, at a time when it's thinking about um, projecting military power, maybe in limited ways in Afghanistan, um, the Indian foreign policy establishment is not getting the kind of support from the central government budget and resources that it needs. So it's very, we know from experience that uh, projecting power successfully needs diplomatic might. Right now, India's resources for power projection are not, are not aligning um, with very carefully navigating the, complement, uh, the complicated diplomatic scheme that is Afghanistan. So for that reason, it seems to me like it's good for India to maintain, its maintain and expand its economic projects in Afghanistan and the region, but to really be very careful about deepening security cooperation related to Afghanistan. And the last re reason for that and the thing that India, Afghanistan, and the United States, and we all grapple with is to what degree can this set of regional actors provide some reassurance to Pakistan? Um, so it seems to me like staying in the economic realm and being light in the security realm is one way. I don't think, as Michael said, there are no easy answers to this question, but, but the way I frame the problem is that we have to think about the interests of not just Pakistan as a country, but the Pakistani military. What are the corporate interests of the Pakistani military that, that conducts the security policy of the state? And what is the threat understanding of the Pakistani military? So in terms of those two questions, the corporate interests and the threat understanding, maybe there are small reassurance related gestures to make in terms of providing resources, um, reassuring in terms of Baloch separatism or Pashtun nationalism. Every once in a while, some Indian a military or foreign policy official makes a sort of unhelpful statement about uh, greater India that then you know proceeds to loom very large in Pakistani military minds for the next year. Those some things I don't know. I don't know how far small gestures can be can go in terms of accommodating Pakistan and making it a willing participant like China has become in India's uh, economic footprint in, in Afghanistan, but, but as just a final remark, I feel like that's the last piece that's, that's worth thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And next we're going to turn to Matt and Pace, going to talk a little bit about uh, the Taliban and ISIS threat in Afghanistan. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Ginger and IWP for having the opportunity to uh, speak to you all today. And also, I'd like to pass my thanks along to Michael and Dr. Abbas for their very insightful observations. Uh, one quick caveat for myself, uh, I'm here today representing only myself, not uh, any opinion that I put out there is mine, mine alone, and does not represent any official stance of the U.S. government or the Defense Department. I forget, that goes for me too. <laughs> um, uh, that said, I'd like to explain to you uh, what we're currently looking at with the security situation in Afghanistan uh, and some of the challenges that it presents for our new uh, U.S. South uh, Asia policy and some of the mechanics of that policy and what, what we will be looking at for benchmarks uh, throughout this year and early next year. Uh, as with uh, economic and, and political uh, intrigue, Afghanistan uh, lies at the intersection of a lot of competing powers, a lot of competing cultures, and a lot of uh, overlapping uh, cultures and economies. But it's also an intersection for various insurgent terrorist groups. There's at least 23 active in the region, depending on, on the definition used of terrorist group. Uh, but I will focus on three main ones today that play a direct role in shaping U.S. foreign policy in Afghanistan. Uh, one is the Afghan Taliban, which we're all very familiar with. 
Uh, the second is Al Qaeda, and the third is the Islamic State franchise operating in between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, known by the acronym ISIS K, Islamic State in Khorasan Province. Uh, these are the three uh, deadliest groups, uh, give or take, out of the 23 plus operating in the region uh, in terms of shedding Afghan blood directly. One of the issues you will have continually seen over the past at least 15, if not 16 years, is references to the threat that Al Qaeda poses uh, to U.S. interests both in the region and here uh, on the homeland. Uh, and as you saw in the uh, August speech, Al Qaeda was again uh, mentioned directly that one of the purposes of maintaining uh, U.S. military installations and, and a robust presence in Afghanistan is tied to that threat. Uh, the other issue was uh, an aim to defeat ISIS-K and to prevent the Afghan Taliban from taking over Afghanistan. We have three distinct groups that are in competition with each other, yet they overlap in the same space. So the Afghan Taliban, generally speaking, is an Islamic insurgency seeking to overthrow the current Afghan government, replace, it, replace that system with something that most likely uh, resembles its former regime in the mid-1990s. They do not have transnational aims, nor are they sectarian in nature of their attacks. By contrast, Al-Qaeda does have transnational jihadist aims, very, very much an anti-Western, anti-American entity, and does not necessarily need territory in Afghanistan and Pakistan to A, remain cohesive, but B, to strike targets U.S. installations, whether it be in Western Europe or here on the homeland. The other important issue that I would raise is since 2001, Al-Qaeda as we understood it prior to 9-11, immediately after 9-11, no longer exists. That network, that entity that had global capabilities to strike inside the United States and strike multiple U.S. installations across the globe no longer exists as we once understood it. So when you see the rhetoric being uh, used that Al-Qaeda represents a grave and an imminent danger to the U.S. homeland, I would seriously caution re-examining that particular analytic point. Uh, a rather new uh, group that has uh, taken on spotlight is ISIS-K. The group, and I won't belabor the, the history part of this, a lot of it is available um, uh, easily uh, researchable, uh, but really since 2015 forward, the group has emerged in Afghanistan and in parts of Pakistan. But interestingly, it's a cabal of disaffected, disenfranchised, both Pakistani Taliban and Afghan Taliban commanders. Uh, coming together under the black flag uh, with very, very loose ties to ISIS Maine, which at the time was headquartered in Syria and, and parts of Iraq. The other group um, is the Afghan Taliban, which we have dealt with uh, off and on for almost 20 plus years at, at this point, which has taken on many different iterations as well. And I would say we're probably in Taliban 3.0 uh, right now. Um, and, 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 and what does this group really uh, compromise or comprise of? Well, most of the individuals are Afghan nationals. Uh, there is a, a, a Pakistani footprint, Pakistani support uh, built into that as well. And now that, of course, goes into the frontier regions where these groups kind of overlap to a certain degree. And not to uh, complicate the matters, but as Michael had pointed out earlier, the Pakistani Taliban franchise is essentially a group that is made up of over 27 different factions, all with different aims, uh, and, and, and at times in history they can kind of coalesce and have a general objective that they agree upon, but then within weeks or months they're disagreeing on what those aims and uh, objectives are and they're starting to divert. We see that with the Afghan Taliban as well. And as you have heard about the Haqqani Network, uh, there are some estimates that this is an independent, almost autonomous group from the Taliban. Uh, it's my opinion that the group is fully subsumed within the Afghan Taliban infrastructure. Uh, their aims are a little bit more focused. Their area of operations are a little bit more focused in eastern Afghanistan and the capital of Kabul. But give, uh, by and large, they operate under the premise of the Afghan Taliban and its supreme leadership. So... 
we often talk about, and we also uh, often hear about um, things like condition-based timelines for withdrawal uh, and, and, and things of that nature. You, listening to U.S. 4A commanders in Afghanistan, you will also hear them talk about winning, the need to win. Now, there's a, a slight difference between succeeding in Afghanistan and this more broad term of winning in Afghanistan. The definition of winning in Afghanistan is very elusive, uh, but currently we're operating under conditions which expects the Afghan government to control 80% or more of the territory by 2020 as a condition for winning. Uh, currently, the Afghan government, according to U.S. government in information, is roughly in control of 56% of Afghan territory currently. That is down significantly from 72% in 2015. So given the new implementations with the South Asia policy, a little bit more robust of a, a U.S. footprint, U.S. aerial capabilities, uh, and as you saw with the true military might that was used recently uh, in the past years, uh, last year actually, was the MOAD uh, and, and, and things of that nature. Now, are we any closer to succeeding or winning with, with these new conditions? Uh, as you have often heard around this time each year on the onset of the Afghan fighting season, pundits and analysts and officials will all tell us that this is the most uh, consequential fighting season to date. Uh, that's rhetoric that's repeated almost each, each spring, uh, at least for the past 10 years that I'm aware of. Uh, however, there is a kernel of truth to that. Uh, this will be a very, very telling uh, fight this year. The Taliban assumes that the U.S. is serious when it says we're going to give it our all this year to see if we can change conditions, uh, continue training Afghan national security forces to a capability, a level of capability that they can uh, conduct security operations independent of U.S. and coalition support, but also succeed in controlling and maintaining that level of influence over Afghan territory, particularly in the rural environments. My colleague, uh, Matt Deering will have an excellent presentation on, on some of the dynamics of rural Afghanistan and, and the security environment, uh, very complex. Uh, so when I say this generally, it, 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 it kind of takes away some of the power of, of how complex these security environments are in Afghanistan. But today uh, offers a very, very uh, in, intriguing look at, at what we can expect for this fighting season. There was multiple suicide attacks throughout Kabul today. And at first, uh, it, it was relayed that the infrastructure under attack were voter registration centers. It turned out that the targets were all Afghan police headquarters or substations. And interestingly, yet not surprising, we see ISIS-K claim partial responsibility. We see the Afghan Taliban claim partial responsibility for the attacks. And then we have the Afghan government blaming the Haqqani network. This is just a glaring example of the complexities of the security environment and where the truth actually lies uh, at, at this intersection of insecurity in the region. Very difficult task ahead for both the coalition and the Afghan national security forces to regain that much territory. Uh, and I think personally that we're at a, a, a point now that we're not necessarily going to see the Afghan government succeed in regaining too much territory but we may also not be in a position to see the Afghan government lose an extraordinary amount of territory over the next several months. But what does that take us to in uh, 2019 and looking forward in, into 2020? As with all things Afghanistan, it's, it's very much dependent on uh, cycles. We will have a much better uh, optic probably come October once this fighting season begins to wind down ahead of uh, the onset of winter. But we're also looking at a key uh, Afghan election being held in, in late October. So that landmark, how will that succeed? Those are uh, additional benchmarks for a relative stability in the country uh, that should not be neglected either. Early next year, the uh, Afghan presidential election is expected to be held next May. And again, if that is um, delayed any further, pushed back or canceled, again, those are kind of a little bit more tangible metrics on how well we are succeeding with this policy or not. 
so I would just advise to continue watching the situation unfold closely. We're at a point now where the momentum is is very much in a it, in, um, very aggressive. We should expect to see, unfortunately and very tragically, a, a very robust, very, very aggressive fighting season uh, for the next several months. And we'll just have to see how the Afghan uh, national security forces come out on this and what kind of changes U.S. policy can bring uh, during that time point. Uh, with that, I will conclude, obviously, uh, open for Q&A when that session arrives, but I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ginger. And finally, we have Matt Deering, who is going to talk to us a little bit about um, some of the irregular forces, civilian production, uh, and challenges to state society relations. Do we have, uh, do we have slides? Uh, yeah, it should queue. Well, while they're getting that together, uh, I just want to say um, uh, thank you, Ginger, for offering this opportunity, as well as uh, Institute of World Politics. Really appreciate this opportunity to be able to talk about these strategic challenges. Thank you to my fellow panelists. Uh, for really helping shape the complexity of the security environment that South Asia faces. Um, and here we are. So I just have a couple images here. Uh, one is, <clears throat> take a look at this picture here. Uh, obviously, all kinds of stereotypes or ideas might come up in your mind. What exactly are we dealing with here? Who are these gentlemen in the, the foreground here? Um, this is actually a photo uh, taken from a journalist of a paramilitary group in Logar province uh, a couple years ago. Paramilitary groups are one of our solutions in Afghanistan. Uh, it was also one of the Soviet Union's solutions in Afghanistan as they were uh, gradually escalating conflict and then de-escalating and uh, detaching themselves from the conflict in Afghanistan. So um, what is a paramilitary group? Well, it's essentially, I define it as a state-sponsored uh, informal armed actor. Um, they generally have a patron, so there's a patron-client relationship. Uh, that patron generally provides resources, support, um, maybe training, uh, ideally some accountability and oversight. <clears throat> In the case of Afghanistan here, the U.S. and NATO forces have really been engaged with paramilitary groups uh, from October 2001 when they initially invaded. Uh, there's a statue that was just placed in New York City by the 9-11 memorial commemorating the um, the horse soldiers, the U.S. Special Forces, Green Berets, that uh, fought with General Dostum and a number of his paramilitary uh, forces to, quote unquote, liberate the people of northern Afghanistan from the tyranny of Taliban rule. Uh, of course, this there is a, I would argue, a conundrum between the U.S. and NATO's support towards paramilitary groups, um, which is a model of counterinsurgency and follow that line out, state building itself. Uh, there's a conundrum there between that and sort of our theoretical practice of state building, which is the support of liberal peace process, uh, democratic institutions, in, uh, formalized, uh, non-personalized institutions uh, that get that's very difficult to carry out when you're also supporting very personalized informal institutions such as paramilitary groups warlord factions power brokers militias vigilantes there's all kinds of names for them <laughs> um, but I tend to tend to characterize them all as uh, paramilitary groups it's a usually and, and I, I would note that they Ten paramilitary groups are, we're not talking about Taliban, Haqqani Network, we're not talking about groups that are 
against the state. We're talking about groups that are either supportive of the state or at least the status quo in the area, which oftentimes actually is avoidance of the state itself. Uh, one of the places I served in, in Ghazni province, 2013, or 2012 and 2013, there was a local uprising of um, against the Taliban in Andar districts, but also in a couple other districts nearby. Um, that local uprising, which represented a vigilantes at the local level, uh, really historically, the, the, the grievances amongst those locals went back to the 1970s and 80s, where you had uh, sort of uh, factions, kind of like gang rivalry between um, then Harakats and then is Hezbi Islami um, no, political groups. Um, so those forces were, they were against the Taliban, but many of them also, after interviewing them, they would say, we're also not necessarily for Kabul government either. We kind of just want to be left alone. Um, so paramilitary groups are, really they are a state building tool. They are a tool for state builders. Um, and one of the questions that, <coughs> that entertains this brief is that, uh, is what factors motivate these paramilitary groups? Um, are they necessarily the same factors which the, s the state builder patrons themselves are uh, seeking to achieve? You know, essentially stability, uh, long-term stability, um, and formalized institutions. Uh, and what are the factors that motivate, motivate Afghan paramilitaries in particular within what I term is a market of protection. I have a sort of a model, theoretical model I'm building. Um, paramilitaries are a function of their environment, all right? Uh, so environment, historically speaking, culturally, politically. Um, ultimately, their function is a balance between protecting and praying. These are scales that characterize the market of protection. And a market of protection is essentially an economic model of the use of force. Now, literature varies in what the motivations of are of paramilitaries. And there's sort of the greed literature that they're seeking out resources. There's grievances that they, they might have, historical or political. Um, there might be a sort of a defense of their culture, their way of life, tradition. Paramilitaries are also influenced by outside forces, patrons, uh, notably, um, but also resources that are coming in from the outside, and and more so in, you know, I'll say since two thousand one, uh, the the level of interconnectivity, uh, globalization itself, modernity, uh, frequently has an influence on paramilitaries. Uh, and, and you know, their motivations. Now, traditionally, oversight, accountability, um, resource allocations are all controlling processes that a patron uh, will hold over a paramilitary client in this market of protection. And these patrons, they can be local, they can be traditional, or they can be foreign, they can be outside. <laughs> they can be foreign in a sense of not from not from my neighborhood, uh, but they could also be foreign in a sense of, you know, NATO forces, U.S. forces. <clears throat> in contemporary state building, local and foreign patrons, they balance their patronage relationship with paramilitaries through what I term complementary governance. Uh, it's a shared form of governing over the actions, the behavior, and the output of paramilitaries. Now, the stronger the complementary governance is exhibited over paramilitaries, the less likely these paramilitary forces will engage in predation on the population. Uh, so, let me go through quickly just some, uh, some items from the case study I, I just mentioned previously in Ghazi province and our district. Um, <coughs> This case is interesting in that it shows how 
the development of an extractive industry might become a violent competition for power, resources, and access. Uh, in this case, you would expect really that paramilitary groups, if they're really seeking out uh, lootable resources or, or th things that they could you know, extract from the environment in order to gain and profit, that in Ghazi province, this would certainly be the place to do so. Uh, outlines in the map here, um, let's see, so there's there's these those white boxes, if you can see them, those are sort of primary mining regions, uh, access to really artisanal mining, such as gold down in the southern region of Makor, or I'm sure there's a point around here. Oh, I'll try not to hit you in the eyes, Ramiz. <laughs> Don't look this way. Uh, actually, it's not going off the, but it's fine. Um, gold as an artisanal mining, as, as well as chromite. These are sort of primary um, lootable resources that these groups could have access. Um, but in, 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 we often overlook in the extractive uh, resource industry, one factor that came, really comes out in this case, which is the lootability of land itself. Uh, and what I found in this case is that with the construction of Highway 1, which is that large, that, that long yellow line cutting through the province, um, uh, there was an, a significant increase in the usurpation of land in the region by uh, power brokers who were tied to so many of these paramilitary groups, or at least the um, uh, tied to ac access to these paramilitary groups. Uh, so land was a critical, valuable commodity, not only in this province, but all throughout Afghanistan. It's often gifted it's a mean, it's as, a, uh, as a form of sharing patronage. Uh, it's a means of livelihood via rents, um, capital accumulation. And it certainly provides access to secondary lootable resources, as you can see in this map, if you were to control areas such as uh, the chromite extraction rings up in the north or the artisanal gold mining in the south. Um, but also access to marketplaces. Anyone who has land near nearby Highway 1 has considerable access to a booming um, economic marketplace that's going on around the highway. <clears throat> well, look at the evidence. Ghazi had over 150,000 acres of land seized by uh, what locals call the land mafia. Um, and this, this land was primarily seized around Highway 1. Um, not surprisingly, we often supported the very members of this land ma mafia because they also provided uh, other services for us. When I say us, I'm referring to um, uh, U.S. forces, uh, uh, members of the provincial reconstruction team, NATO forces, etc. Uh, because those who were also a part of this land mafia were also recruiting local police or engaged in fighting the Taliban. Uh, one prominent member named Khalil Hotak uh, was leader of a non-governmental organization called the Salvation Council. He was also head of the um, Provincial Reintegration Committee. Um, he was the most prominent recruiter of Afghan local police uh, in the province. So, there were two primary uh, paramilitary groups in Ghazi province. Uh, one were the local uprising. One were the local uprisers. Uh, these were essentially vigilante groups that were uh, fighting against the Taliban and in support of the state and the status quo. The other were those who actually who broke away from the uprising groups and were formalized into Afghan local police. And we found that those who actually were given the choice to 
come over into the Afghan local police, which were which was a program that was essentially controlled by U.S. Special Forces. Uh, there was much more accountability, oversight, uh, resource distribution uh, provided towards these Afghan local police, which as well as a uh, a relationship with the local community that provided the complementary governance necessary to ensure that these ALP, Afghan local police, would remain accountable and there would be oversight. On the other hand, the other group, the uprisers, that refused to join with the Afghan local police, or could not because they had um, maybe nefarious records, um, or couldn't make it through the training, or just simply chose not to join, uh, often did so because there were other resources that they could gain remaining armed actors in the conflict, um, still benefiting from some of the resource distributions by the U.S. forces, um, but not necessarily having the same oversight and accountability mechanisms in place. So the complementary governance uh, wasn't, essentially wasn't there for them, which led to a lot of the uprisers engaging in more predatory behavior than the Afghan local police. Now, the Afghan local police, which has been a somewhat successful program, um, there's been some uh, critics of it, some detractors, um, there's been many studies uh, regarding the program itself. It's had, um, according to some officials, mixed results at best, um, with only one third of the areas that they patrolled seeing improvements in security. There is a, a, another plan, though, going forward, which is uh, likely going to see the Afghan local police integrated into a new program that is likely going to be rolled out after parliamentary elections next year. And it's also this program is based off of an Indian model that was used in Jammu and Kashmir called the Territorial Army. This program is called the Afghan National Army Territorial Force. I'm um, just showing you a map here of Nangal Province, which is in the east of Afghanistan. This is going to be the pilot location for, uh, I'm assuming, the first Afghan National Army Territorial Force, ANATF. They like their acronyms. <laughs> um, NATO specialists actually went to uh, went to India in September of 2017 and studied the uh, Indian Territorial Army, their model that they had in place, and they came back and recommended it to uh, to NATO and to the Afghan government to try to implement this program. And essentially, what it what it will be is um, up to 36,000 recruits. That will be at a full-time basis, essentially. Uh, some might be at a reserve basis. Uh, they will be integrated amongst 7,500 Ministry of Defense Army officers who will be in charge of these uh, of the new territorial army. They will be directly aligned with the Ministry of Defense. They'll wear Afghan National Army uniforms. They'll work at the provincial level. Assuming they'll, they'll be recruited between the ages of 20 and 40. Uh, and their goal essentially would be to stabilize areas cleared by regular security forces and establish law and order. They will essentially be a part of the shaping and whole phase of Afghanistan's counterinsurgency operations in places like Nangahar, which are still facing significant uh, insurgent and terrorist threats. Oversight will be by specific Afghan National Army Corps. Funding will continue to come from the U.S., particularly from c -Sticka. Um And it will, it, it will be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, they're, they're, again, like the Afghan local police, this, there are many critics of already of this program before it's been rolled out. Uh, I did an interview with a senior ranking member of the Afghan army who noted that this territorial army will be a more proactive and offensive fighting force uh, that will be used more like the coast protection force, if anyone knows what that is, was essentially a counterterrorism uh, team of Afghans uh, tied with uh, CIA officers, paramilitary officers working in the coast region to essentially hunt down 
terrorists and insurgents. Um, so this is still in the development process. Uh, there are certainly a lot of questions that need to be asked in terms of are there going to be real measures of oversight and accountability? Um, what does a what kind of holding will a territorial army really do? What kind of control will they have? What's what what the, what would the length of that look like? Um, what will transition look like in terms of uh, transitioning over to local police forces? Um, will they have law enforcement powers? Uh, how much say and oversight will U.S. forces their primary sponsors, how much oversight will they have? Who will they be accountable to? Will the Leahy vetting rules come into effect in terms of uh, providing funding for certain units? Um, and you know, tying back to my case study in Ghazni, what does the resource architecture look like in these areas? Is that something that we need to worry about in terms of who benefits and who loses from areas being controlled? Uh, there are many critics who say that the Afghan army, particularly the officer corps, is very much tied to power brokers, personalities. Uh, that could be a dangerous recipe when you, um, you know, bring out a new unit that's going to have significant local control uh, of areas. Um, so I will end there. Look forward to the Q&A. Thank you again. Great. Thank you, Jeff.